Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing cancer as a metabolic disease with professor of biology at Boston College and best-selling author, Dr. Thomas Seyfried. Find out how metabolism and diet play a fundamental role in the origin, management, and prevention of cancer. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be talking with Professor Thomas Safery today about cancer as a metabolic disease. Thank you very much uh, for the invite to this uh, to this interview. No, of course. Listen, it's a it's a real pleasure to have you on, Professor. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on. Uh, we have the pleasure of speaking with Professor Thomas Safery today. Uh, he's a world-renowned cancer metabolic expert. Uh, he is professor of biology at Boston College mm -hmm. and best-selling author of the book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, The Origin, Management, and Prevention of Cancer. Uh, he received his PhD in genetics and biochemistry from the University of Illinois. He completed his undergraduate work at the University of New England, where he was recently uh, nominated as a Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award, and he won that. He also holds a master's degree in genetics from Illinois State University and was a postdoctoral fellow at Yale, where he stayed on in the Department of Neurology afterwards. Of note, uh, Professor Seyfried also served with distinction in the U.S. Army's 1st Cavalry Division during the Vietnam War and received numerous medals. Uh, he has numerous other awards from various institutions, including uh, the American Oil Chemist Society, the National Institutes of Health, the American Society for Neurochemistry, and the American Epilepsy, Ep Epilepsy Society. Uh, he has served as chair on the Scientific Advisory Committee for the National tay -Sachs Association, and his groundbreaking work on cancer has led to over 180 peer-reviewed publications. He also recently received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Integrative Medicine, uh, and he serves on m multiple editorial boards. And here to, he's here today to discuss cancer as a metabolic disease. Super interesting topic. I've known about it for a while, but really delved into it in the last week or two. And pleasure to talk to you today about this super interesting hypothesis. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to address issues and discuss the depths of these uh, new concepts. Awesome. So let's just start by, by going over some basics. What is the definition of cancer, in your opinion, and the globally mm -hmm. accepted version? Well, I guess if you look into the um, college te textbook or cell biology book, it's a very simple cell division out of control is basically the definition of cancer. So, uh, dysregulated cell growth, cell division out of control is basically what cancer is. And what do we know about the processes that lead to malignant transformation of these cells, right? Cells go from, from dividing normally and then apoptosis, which is where they die off normally. And then in certain subpopulations, they become malignant where it's unregulated. What do we currently know about that process? Yeah, well, when we look into um, uh, the origin of cancer, as, as we know that um, Saint, uh, Albert St. Georgi called it the oncogenic paradox, you know, like how many different provocative agents could elicit uh, a cancer? Uh, and what was missing was a common pathophysiological mechanism uh, that could account for how a cell that is under growth regulation could fall back and become dysregulated in growth. And uh, what all cancers, at least all the major cancers that I've looked at under the, with electron microscopy evaluations, they all have abnormalities in the number structure and function of mitochondria to some, to some degree uh, or another, regardless of what kind of a cancer it is. So, so what happens then is that a gradual disruption of oxidative phosphorylation uh, leads to a gradual compensatory fermentation mechanism. So, Cancer could be initiated by um, carcinogens and you know, uh, intermittent hypoxia, various oncogenic viruses, rare inherited mutations, any number of different things, but they all impact uh, directly on the mitochondria chronic, chronically. Any acute damage to the mitochondria of the cell will kill the cell through an apoptotic mechanism. However, they bypass that only because they shift their metabolism to a fermentation metabolism. And that uh, allows them to be resistant um, to their further growth control. It's important to uh, remember and recognize that the mitochondria controls the cell signaling cycle, the cyclins and the growth regulation of the cell through a number of different 
interconnected mechanisms. So what happens is when that organelle loses its ability to control the energy within the cell, these cells fall back on ancient pathways that were existing on the planet for all organisms before oxygen came into the atmosphere some 2.5 billion years ago. So these cells are doing nothing more than falling back on, on ancient pathways uh, driven by fermentation metabolism, and uh, they lose their growth control, and any number of provocative agents uh, could elicit this, uh, this process. So just to kind of, kind of dumb it down just for the layperson, cancer cells derive energy in a very different way than normal tissue cells. What is a two or three sentence summary of how a cancer cell gets energy versus a normal cell? Cancer cell, normal cells, um, uh, let's put it first, let's look at the normal cell. Uh, the normal cells in our body derive uh, most of their energy through oxidative phosphorylation, uh, uh, through the electron transport chain in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So we breathe, the bottom line is you breathe air every day, we're all breathing. Uh, every breath that we take in brings oxygen into our system. Uh, we make energy in the mitochondria normally, and the waste products are basically CO2 and water, are the waste products of, of oxidative phosphorylation generating energy. Very efficient process. Cancer cells, on the other hand, don't have that available. So they have gradually upregulated these ancient pathways of fermentation. So they, they, use, they develop energy through what we call substrate level phosphorylation. And that could occur through the glycolytic pathway at the pyruvate kinase step, or which we have now defined as the real origin of energy is through mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. This is through the glutaminolysis pathway. So that's where the energy comes. Cancer cells have a, a, a ravenous appetite for glutamine and it's the glutamine uh, that generates the energy uh, in the mitochondria, but not through oxidative phosphorylation. So the glucose carbons are used mostly for biomass. In other words, you, you have to have the raw materials to grow and the energy is coming largely through uh, a fermentation, an amino acid glutamine fermentation mechanism in, in, in the mitochondria. Now the other interesting concept was the fact that cancer, for the most part, many people view it as a genetic disease, right? You have mutations, these mutations lead to issues and then they kind of mm -hmm. multiply over time. Is cancer primarily a metabolic disease or is it a genetic disease? Is it both? What's the cause? What's the effect? Well, it's, it's primarily a mitochondrial metabolic disease. You have in the same cancer cell, you have uh, a plethora of mutations in the nucleus. You know, some of these are passengers, drivers. There's a whole litany of different kinds of names for the mutations that you find in the nucleus of cancer cells. Uh, and then, of course, there are some cancer cells that have been looked at in depth, but they can't find any mutation. So the, those are generally not discussed uh, in, any, in any significant way. On the other hand, within the same cell, you also have uh, defects in the cytoplasm, and that defect is in the mitochondria. So you have two fundamental organelles, uh, prime, prime organelles in the cell that have defects. You have mutations in the nucleus, and you have abnormalities in the cytoplasm in the mitochondria. The, the question is, what, what, is the, what is the cause and what is the effect? So, so those experiments have been done quite uh, convincingly, repeated numerous times in a variety of model systems and across uh, a variety of, of different experimental designs. And that is, we know normal cells um, give rise to normal cells that are uh, growth regulated. And we know that cancer cells give rise to cancer cells, uh, which are growth dysregulated. So the, the prime phenotype we're looking at here is growth dysregulation or, or unregulated cell growth. So the question becomes, is it the mutations in the nucleus or is it the defect in the cytoplasm that underlies growth dysregulation? So that's been directly studied by, if you take the, um, the nucleus from the tumor cell that has all the mutations and transplant that nucleus into a, into a normal cytoplasm with normal mitochondria, the, the cells that are produced are growth regulated. They're not growth dysregulated, despite the presence of the nucleus that contains the mutations. And this was done in frogs and human uh, hybrid cells and, and mouse cells, um, a variety of organisms. So you, re, you reestablish growth regulation 
uh, in cells with normal mitochondria, despite the, pre the continued presence of a nucleus full of various kinds of mutations. On the other hand, if the nucleus of a normal cell is implanted into the cytoplasm of a tumor cell, and this was done by Israel and Schaefer quite a, quite a number of years ago, you either get dead cells or cells that become growth uh, dysregulated. So, um, so consequently, what these, what these, these are the most profound experiments that exclude cancer of being a genetic disease. It cannot be a genetic disease. So the, the question then is, where, where, where do all these mutations come from and what do they do? Uh, basically, they're downstream effects of disturbed energy metabolism. So when the, when the mitochondria become defective gradually over a protracted period, they, they throw out ROT, ROS, reactive oxygen species, which are carcinogenic and mutagenic. So the mutations in the nucleus of these tumor cells, and I'm talking about all the different kinds of tumor cells, are basically downstream effects of disturbed energy metabolism. So the origin of cancer is damage to oxidative phosphorylation uh, linked to a compensatory fermentation with many different defects, like many of the hallmarks of cancer put out by uh, Hanahan and Weinberg are all downstream epiphenomena of the, da of the original damage to oxidative phosphorylation. Now, how does that play a role with um, telomerase? Telomerase is clearly involved in tumor progression. How does mitochondrial function uh, dovetail with telomerase activity? Well, yeah, well, telomerase is usually activated in cancer cells. It's linked to the energetic state of the cell from what we can see. So um, it's usually high in cells that ferment or, or rapidly uh, dysregulated growth. It's much lower activity in in resting cells, normal cells of the body. Um, but the issue here we have to look at is this: the cancer cell cannot survive uh, without fermentable fuels. So if you target and restrict the availability of the fermentable fuels, the cell will die, uh, regardless of what the telomerase activity is. So telomerase activity is another phenotype that's downstream of the, of the damage to the most of the stuff that people study are all downstream effects of a, of a fundamental disturbance in energy metabolism. So let me go over two of those that are very highly focused on. Um, angiogenesis, which is the mm -hmm. creation of new blood vessels, and the evasion of apoptosis. Those are obviously both downstream. And what is the hypothesis as to why those occur with a disturbed mitochondrial function? Yeah, so uh, that's a, excellent. These are great uh, points because a lot of people need to need to know these connections. And and you know basically when you lose mitochondrial function, uh, there's a retrograde signaling system uh, from the from the mitochondria to the nucleus. And what and what it says to the nucleus is that we're stu we're, we're suffocating, uh, and the nucleus then uh, goes through uh, 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 they upregulate a number of transcription factors, one of which is HIF one alpha you know, uh, hypoxia inducible factor uh, alpha. It's always produced and it's always degraded very rapidly. But under hypoxic conditions or conditions where oxfos is dysfunctional, it becomes stabilized. And HIF is a transcription factor for a variety of different genes, the glycolytic pathway, also vascular endothelial growth factor, which is the factor that uh, drives angiogenesis. So va uh, uh, VEGF is under the control of HIF1 alpha, if one alpha is upregulated as the result of dis disturbed energy metabolism. So you can see the linkage, the, you know, disturbed energy metabolism, mitochondria stress response to the nucleus, nucleus stabilize, upregulates and stabilizes HIF, one alpha, through the py pyrrole hydroxylase activity, upregulating up up glycolysis, vascular endothelial growth factor, and uh, abnormal blood vessels. As far as apoptosis is concerned, the mitochondria is the kill switch of the cell, it controls apoptosis. And when it loses its ability to control uh, regulated energy metabolism, the, the cell bypasses, the, the kill switch is now broken and the cell bypasses apoptosis. So again, it comes right back to the disturbance in energy metabolism within the mitochondria. Now, what about um, metastatic disease, cancer spreading throughout the body? I was reading a bunch on this and trying to figure out how the two relate. And it seems like they were able to correlate metastatic phenomenon with disturbed mitochondrial function. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, well, you have to also look at the biology of the problem. So the question is, you know, what, how does the metastatic cancer cell differ 
from the non-metastatic cancer cell because there's a lot of tumor cells, stem cells and all kinds of different cells. They grow like crazy, very fast, very rapid, but they don't metastasize. Um, you know, they can kill by, by mass effects. Uh, they can be very angiogenic, but they don't spread. So the question is, what is the difference between the neoplastic cell that grows rapidly versus the neoplastic cell that doesn't grow so rapidly, but has the capacity to uh, enter and exit tissues, suppress the immune system, uh, and uh, uh, just take up residence in different parts of the body. And we and others have shown that this cell is actually a, a, it's a mesenchymal cell of, of macrophage origin. And how this happens is intriguing. It was originally pointed out by Akil back in 1902, uh, 0102. He says there's a fusion hybridization between uh, parts of our immune system to try to heal cancer. And cancer is also often viewed as an unhealed wound. So uh, cells of our immune system come into this wound to put out the fire and try to heal the disturbance, which is lactic acid being thrown out. It looks like a wound. And in their ability to heal the wound, they fuse with some of these non-metastatic neoplastic cells. And you have this hybrid cell, which, which now has a genetic cap, because macrophages already have the genetic capability of uh, entering and exiting tissues, uh, to, uh, uh, in survival in the bloodstream. I mean, there are, 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 are protectors of our body against bacterial infections. So what happens is we get a fusion hybridization. Now you have a cell that is genetically programmed to move in and out of tissues and spread around the body, but it's growth dysregulated. So it has a dysregulated cell growth. And, uh, and, and this is the origin. Now, what we did is we went through all the major cancers uh, that are known to be metastatic, and every one of them expressed characteristics of macrophages. So, so it's very clear that if you have glioblastoma, if you have lung cancer, all of these different cancers have many mesenchymal features. And they can come from, the, from fusion with the local macrophage like microglia or or um, you know, Kupfer cells in the liver. Uh, you can have alveolar macrophage. All of the metastatic invasive cells have characteristics of macrophage, and their growth dysregulated, and they suppress the immune system, and it makes it very difficult. However, we know that they, like all other cancers, are driven by fermentation, glucose and glutamine. So it becomes very, e I wouldn't say easy, but it becomes very clear to how to kill them and get rid of them. So once you understand the biology of the problem, the strategies for managing these diseases, it becomes much, much clearer, much more clear. Now, what about viruses, right? Viruses have been shown to correlate with certain cancers. In your opinion, how does viral infection ultimately lead to mitochondrial dysfunction? Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, there's a, there's a several different mechanisms that have been already uh, uh, discussed and, and, and published. Uh, a virus, uh, they're called onco oncogenic viruses as opposed to some, some other kinds of viruses. You know, some of them are, are facilitators of, of neoplasia directly causing cancer, and some of them, uh, some of them participate indirectly in, in, in facilitating the growth of the tumor. So like papillomaviruses or hepatitis C viruses, which are, which are origins of cancer, they actually, the viral particles themselves or products of the viral genome enter the mitochondria and disturb oxidative phosphorylation in only those cells that are prone to be infected uh, by the virus, like hepatocytes in the liver or various uh, types of epithelial cells in, in, uh, in sex organs and things like this, papillomaviruses, or uh, yeah, these kinds. And, and, and so we know that they are gradually disturbing energy metabolism of population, pop populations of cells. Then there are other like human cytomegaloviruses, which actually, once the cell is transformed, uh, they enter the cell and they actually act as um, turbochargers for using glucose and glutamine more, more aggressively. So the virus particles can uh, 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 drive cancer in a number of different ways. They can be the origin through, def the, through damage to oxfos, or they can be superchargers in getting the cancer cell to grow even faster by upregulating the ability to use glucose, the two fermentable fuels that drive uh, most, if not all, cancers. Now let's get into the real kind of interesting topic, which is if you view cancer as a metabolic disease, which clearly you've shown that's the case, how does that ultimately impact cancer management and cancer treatment and prevention? Do you believe that doctors should be advocating to starve the cancer cells? And, and I use that term meaning that these cancer cells rely on a certain energy source. And if we deprive them, are we able to better manage cancer in your opinion? 
Yeah, that's that's the clear uh, strategy. Um, uh, I guess we could use the term starve or deprive um, because we and others have found, I mean, we know that uh, uh, no cancer cell can survive without glucose and glutamine. I mean, some cancer cells use glutamine a little bit more than glucose, and other cancer cells use glu glucose a little bit more than glutamine. But together, those two fuels are very powerful uh, synergistic uh, metabolites. So the strategy uh, for managing uh, most, if not all, cancers is is to use uh, uh, drugs and diets. So, uh, you need you need the diet to um, reduce the glucose, uh, improve, uh, reduce systemic inflammation. And then you use specific drugs that will target simultaneously the glucose and glutamine pathways. You know, I, I hate to say it. Uh, it's also, it, it's a very embarrassingly simple disease. Uh, we have just made this thing into a, a massively complicated problem. When, when the cells can't, or they need energy. Without energy, the cell can't grow. They're getting their energy from two metabolites, glucose and glutamine. They can't survive without that. Now, the question is how you target glucose and glutamine without harming the normal cells of our body. And that's why when we transition individuals over to nutritional ketosis, the ketone body is an alternative. Normal cells can shift from glucose to, to, to ketone bodies. The tumor cells are locked into this fermentation. Ketones cannot be fermented. They require oxidative phosphorylation. If the oxphos is defective in the tumor cells, then the ketone bodies are not usable by the tumor cell. So you marginalize those cells and their, and their constellation of genetic mutations that they are, there are in the nucleus prevent those cells from making the necessary adaptations uh, to, to, to use alternative fuels. So the mutation collection prevents them. They become far less resilient, like our normal cells evolved over millions of years to be quite versatile uh, using a variety of different fuels. The cancer cell is locked into fermentation. Therefore, the strategy to manage this disease is not terribly complicated. You just have to do, you have to use a, a treatment program that knows how to design uh, a, in a staged way uh, the, the gradual health, uh, making the rest of the body healthy while you gradually degrade the tumor cells that are dependent on fermentation metabolism. So you put all that together and you have a nice strategy uh, to manage cancer. So let's say someone goes 100% hardcore, pure ketogenic diet, just pure proteins, zero carbs, just fats and proteins, 100%. I mean, is there any way for the cancer to grow through that? Oh, yeah. You're not targeting the glutamine. So um, if you don't target the glutamine, that's the energy. So you, you, cancer cells can be slowed down by the diet you just mentioned. But the major, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm really surprised there are some people that we talk to who actually have managed their cancer use, using what you just said, um, which, is fun, which is striking to me because I, 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 I don't know how they're getting around the glutamine block doing that. But the, but the strategy for more effective management would be to do that kind of a, a program with a, drugs that work. Uh, uh, we need drugs to really target that glutamine metabolism. And, you know, we use certain, there's some, uh, you know, off, what they call uh, repurposed drugs, off-patent drugs like, 60 oxynorleucine Don, D-O-N, and there's a, a variety of other glutamine inhibitors. But they alone, used without the rest of the, well, the package, are also insufficient in managing uh, effective management. It's a simple thing. You transition the body to uh, non-fermentable fuels, and then you simultaneously go after the availability of glucose and glutamine. This will eliminate the tumor without causing toxicity to the rest of the body, regardless of the type of cancer that the person might have. Are there any studies that you know about that are that are looking at pure ketogenic diets with a glutamine inhibitor? Um, no, I, I mean I haven't seen it. Yes, you know everybody's doing this thing half-assed. They're using either a, a diet by itself or they're using drugs by themselves. Um, nobody's putting the package together as far as I can see. Um, you know, it, it's the, it's the strategy of clinical trials. You know, you have to know what your drug is doing or you can't interfere with something. You know, the bottom line is how are you going to keep these people alive? I mean, that should be the end point, not, you know, whether your drug is working in a certain way or not. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. I mean, we're, we're, we're putting these people at risk by doing these things that are, that are not complete. You know, you, you have to have a strategy that's going to be just like I said, you've got to use glucose and glutamine targeting simultaneously while transitioning the body over 
to a non-inflammatory state using fuels that the tumor cells can't use. No one is doing that anywhere as far as I know. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It seems seems just intuitive. And based on yeah. what you're saying, it seems like the easiest, least toxic thing to do. Um, I would imagine hopefully someone can kind of jump on that. You know, well, you, I want know, you, you, you know the reason why, right? Because it's because cancer makes money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, unfortunately it's an obscenity, but it's true. And until, and as I said, until there's a business model that can, that can generate the revenue uh, from this uh, strategy, it's not likely that we're going to have any major advances. But, you know, as I said, I think that might be the biggest stumbling block to the management of cancer is how, how can you, how can you uh, generate enough revenue to make up for the lost things that you're going to be doing? And then, and, and so it's a, a business. It's a business decision. Um, That's sad. Yeah, it, but it's true. And and, yep. and the poor patients are the, are being sacrificed as the result of uh, not moving in this direction. Now, I, I want to briefly talk about. You had a hypothesis a couple of years ago about a press pulse therapeutic strategy. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yeah. Well, that's basically. Uh, um, I've touched upon a number of things and. And I, I picked up that concept from Aaron's and West. These guys are paleobiologists, and they str they were trying to study that how uh, we had these mass uh, extinctions of organisms on our planet uh, that that have been part of our um, um, the various evolutionary epochs. And they said the mass extinction occurred when you had a chronic stress on populations, coupled with an acute um, um, uh, pulse, like a meteor strike or some phenomenally drastic thing. So the stress will eliminate the weak, the lame, the, the organisms that are already struggling. Uh, but it keeps the stronger ones around. And then when you have this pulse, you eliminate those as well. So taking that concept to the cancer field, what we decided to do is we, is we put the patients into an extremely healthy uh, physiological state using uh, nutritional uh, ketosis. And then once the body starts to get into a non-inflamed state, then we go after, uh, we put the, the pulses on there. And they are drugs that will specifically uh, eliminate uh, holdout cells, cells that might be a little bit more uh, resilient to these treatments. So first you get rid of the weak ones. You change the whole physiology of the body over to put more pressure on the tumor cells. And then the drugs, which, may have been, which would have been used at the beginning and maybe not having so much therapeutic benefit, now become uh, really powerful uh, inhibitors of cancer. And you do this slowly, uh, but surely over a period of time. So uh, you don't go in there like a bull in a china shop and try to kill all the tumor cells and damage the whole body. You know, you slowly degrade the tumor while at the same time enhancing the health and vitality. And we, what we see is when we use this strategy, uh, not only do cancers go away, but also type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and a variety of other ailments because a lot of cancer patients come in and they have uh, several comorbidities uh, and as well as dysregulated cell growth in some part of their body. So it's a whole body approach to managing cancer. So uh, we correct a lot of the different abnormalities while the tumors are being degraded through this press pulse concept. And, and right now, uh, the concept is there, the outline is there, what, where, where we're at the frontier is dosage, timing, and scheduling. How do we time and dosage all of these different press pulse concepts uh, approaches to make a perfect, like we're working on it right now in the lab, uh, what we call diet drug cocktails. And uh, 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 these are, uh, you put the animal or, or, or into a beautiful or new metabolic state. And then what is the best timing, dosage and scheduling where the different glucose glutamine targeting drugs will work together with the new physiological state of the body. And I'm telling you, man, I, I have never seen some of these animals on death's doorstep, um, uh, you know, they'll be dead in a couple of days, recovered to a, a remarkable state of health. And when this, when this is used in humans in the clinics, eventually, uh, you're going to see the same thing. And people are going to emerge from cancer treatment uh, with a new sense of, uh, of physiological health. Uh, and their tumors will be, for the large part, either gone or in a, in a state where they can be long-term managed. I mean, you've been very clear that you think that the combination of a ketogenic diet with a glutamine inhibitor, dose timing, all of that, you know, needs to be worked out. That's clearly what you're advocating for. And it certainly makes sense based on all of the data. What is your crystal ball view on the next five, 10, 
20 years. What, what major breakthroughs in cancer management do you foresee in the future? Well, I think the first, the first and most important um, um, break change has to happen that cancer is, is, a met, is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. It's not a genetic disease. So that in itself is an earthquake. Uh, that in itself would require a massive paradigm shift just to recognize that, the, that what you thought the disease was is not what it actually is. Um, so that has to be changed. Uh, you have to recognize that uh, without energy, no tumor cell can grow. Therefore, it provides the strategy for, you know, targeting, targeting energy metabolism. Um, you have to know that the two fuels, the metabolites that are responsible for this are glucose and glutamine. We've done a big survey. We can't find another amino acid that can replace glutamine. And glucose is the, is, is the primary sugar that drives this. Uh, people need to know that ketone bodies are, very, are what we call a super fuel. Uh, they enhance the delta G prime of ATP hydrolysis. You have to know why ketone bodies are part of the of the solution. Um, you, you also need, people need to know that when patients are put into these new metabolic states, uh, delivery of drugs to the targeting cancer is so much more improved. We showed that uh, keto, ketogenic diets or or low carb high fat diets facilitate delivery of drugs right through the brain brain barrier into GB, into GBM. Um, you know, trying to get these drugs onto target has been a real problem. Not when the body is, is converted over to metabolic uh, uh, ketosis. Um, so you, ha you have that. The, uh, the other problem that you have to, to, to solve this cancer problem is, is you have to have a, a re-educational program in, in the medical schools. I mean, they need to know the power of, of nutrition, and they need to know how drugs and diets work together to manage their patients. I think the goal for all physicians is how do I keep my patient healthy? How do I have him, her recover from a debilitating disease without, without toxicity? There's a training period. People need to know, why are we studying all these gene mutations when they're largely irrelevant downstream epiphenomenon when the real issue is a, met, is a metabolic problem? And of course, as I've mentioned, you have to have a business model because this is not gonna move forward until someone can figure out how to make a buck on it. You know, it's natural, you know, you're gonna do that. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I'm, I, I know that if what I know right now with the, pro, with the appropriate training and reconfiguration, we could drop the cancer death rate uh, by 50% within five or 10 years. You know, right now we have over 1,600 people a day in the United States dying from cancer. Um, in China, it's 8,000 people a day uh, dying from cancer. This comes from the data from the American Cancer uh, society. Okay, anti-smoking campaigns reduce lung cancer, but if a person has lung cancer, uh, the probability of long-term survival is, is just as bad today as it was decades ago. No major advance in glioblastoma management in 100 years. I mean, what's going on with that? I mean, think of all the advances in science and technology in the last 100 years, and we're still dealing with a 15-month survival for GBM. I mean, this is nuts. Uh, we, we have the capacity right now to make huge advances and keeping people alive in a, in a much healthier state. It's just that there has to be a will and it has to be a recognition uh, to do this. And these are the obstacles, but I think every one of them is an approachable and solvable problem. It just takes the will uh, of the patients and the society to come to realize this. And then we're gonna see major advances. And I think this cancer will be put in its rightful place. It's just one more kind of a, a thing you gotta deal with, but you can deal with it without too much toxicity if you know what you're doing. I mean, what an amazing interview. I'm going to wrap it up because I know that you're super busy. I could honestly talk to you all day. It's, I can tell you as someone who treats cancer, I was not well versed on this, on this theory until recently. So I agree with you. I think that what we need to do is one, educate medical students, educate doctors, really switch the paradigm, like you said, from focusing on genetics over to metabolic. And I think that's something that is not known to the vast majority of physicians, let alone let alone yeah. patients. I think focusing on nutrition is something that we need to do even in childhood. I think children and young adults need to know more about nutrition, not just by the way you look, but by the way you feel and how healthy you are. And I think that all of that put together, you've really simplified cancer. Instead of being this crazy disease that has a million different etiologies, it's just a metabolic disease. It's tied into diet. It's tied into nutrition. And it sounds like there's a very straightforward pathway to control it and to treat it. So, you know, we're obviously going to keep educating here. Thank you so much for your time, yeah. Professor Seyfried. 
unbelievable work you're doing. All right, you should should be super proud. It's 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 very inspirational. Well, thank you very much, and I and I think your your shows will will help facilitate this knowledge, spreading the knowledge around, and things will change. It just will take some time. Absolutely. Thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Okay. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. Bye now. Take care.